are all good to come out on this cold night. Perfect warm up for a talk on energy. I always like to start by thanking the friends whose support makes this program possible. Um, and I also want to thank Catherine Ayers who called me and suggested Mr. Zuckerman. And these community connections are critical, as Alice well knows, to the success of these programs. So keep up the good work. I'm delighted to welcome award-winning journalist and best-selling author Gregory Zuckerman to Concordia tonight. His most recent book, The Frackers, The Outrageous Inside Story of the New Billionaire Wildcatters, examines the 70-year history of fracking in the United States and the global energy revolution and environmental controversy it created. And true to its title, the story is outrageous. Mr. Zuckerman reveals the Wildcatters to be a diverse cast of characters who share a certain American entrepreneurial spirit they are confident, stubborn, and tenacious risk takers whose capacity for optimism and perseverance is mind boggling. Their complex wheeling and dealing is staggering and the amount of money they borrow, lose, earn, and borrow again is just incredible. Even more surprising is how much luck plays a part, plays almost as much a part as science and technology. Fracking is certainly one of the biggest business stories in, the American, uh, in America today. So it's no surprise this special writer for the Wall Street Journal and two-time winner of the Gerald Loeb Award, the highest honor in business journalism, was just the person to cover the story. Reviewers proclaimed the frackers colorful, compelling, a dramatic tale, a first-rate narrative, and a great read. Gregory Zuckerman takes us on a fast-paced roller coaster ride whether you're in favor of fracking or against it, I think you'll agree the frackers is a fascinating and thought provoking. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Zuckerman to this stage. Thanks very much for being here. From the little interaction I've had with uh, um, audience members, it seems like it's a diverse group. There are people, it seems like, who know a lot about uh, the energy world, and there are others that um, may not know what fracking is, so uh, bear with me as I, um, I'll try to address uh, both types of uh, people in the audience, um, and, um, and hopefully we can all learn, and, and I'd love to hear thoughts from people. We'll leave some time for Q&A. Feel free to uh, offend me or try to offend me. Um, I've been offended, or people on, and, it's, and I can, I'd like to hear other perspectives as well. I'm generally a centrist, um, I'm going to cut to the chase here a little bit. So I, I, I believe this whole era is a net, net positive uh, for the country, but there are dangers as well, and we can discuss those, environmental and otherwise. But before that, I'm going to um, first tell you a little bit about how I got to this topic, um, because I'm not an energy reporter, per se. I'm a business writer. So I've been at the Wall Street Journal since 1996, and I've written about all kinds of different topics but mostly financial, mostly Wall Street. And it occurred to me around 2011 or so that there's really no bigger and more important business topic uh, today than this solution going on. You know, excuse me, I'm going to take off my jacket if you get in front of this here. So uh, it occurred to me there's nothing more important than this energy revolution. And some of you obviously know a lot about it, obviously others don't. So I'm going to take a step back first and explain why it's so uh, important for, for all of us. Um, until around 2006 or so, we were a nation that was running out of energy and really scared about the future. No people in this room can remember, I can barely remember, but I have in the back of my memory being on a long line in 1973 in my back seat of my parents' um, car as we waited online to get gasoline. And that was during the Arab um, oil embargo. And ever since then, and we've just as a nation been scared about our future, both natural gas and oil. And today it's all changed dramatically. So we were a country that around 2006 or so, 2007, we're producing 5 million barrels a day of oil. Today it's 9 million barrels. And natural gas has just soared. Today we're talking about 
exporting. We're going to start exporting natural gas as of next year, excuse me, and then we're going to also be exporting probably even oil. We're, going to, we're starting to discuss that. And it's just a crazy thing to think that we were, were scared and we were nervous about the future and we were dependent on people like Saudi Arabia and Venezuela, countries that we really didn't have that much in common with and we didn't want to spend, send all this money to. And now we're actually in the position of exporting natural gas instead of importing it all, and oil as well. So it's a dramatic shift for this country. Um, and there are all kinds of implications. There's the economic implication of this soaring, soaring production. So our natural gas prices have tumbled. We pay about a third to a half of what they do in Europe and in Asia. Um, I'm of the belief that this is really leading to an, an era of, of American economic dominance relative to the rest of the world, partly because we have lower energy costs. And you're seeing a reshoring. You don't want to go overboard with this. Um, some people talk about a manufacturing renaissance in this country, but you are seeing company, companies moving back to this country because they have lower energy costs. Uh, cement companies, tire companies, chemicals, and you're gonna see more of that. In, in, when all is said and done, it uh, depends on what economists you talk to, but people have an estimate of about two million jobs created from this energy surge, this en energy renaissance. And to give some context, that's the number, those are the number of jobs, two million, that we lost during the economic downturn, during the housing downturn. And we, people think that the um, energy surge, the energy renaissance, is, is probably been, resp been responsible for about one percent, one percentage point of GDP. And we've only been growing about three percentage points. So in other words, about a third of this country's growth has come from energy. And you really have to get away from the coasts to realize um, the importance of, of what's happened. And I live in New Jersey. I'm on the East Coast. Um, my wife's from L.A., so we spend a lot of time on the West Coast. But one of the um, privileges you get as a writer for something like this, for a project like this, is, is you get to get out there and, and travel and see America. And I had the privilege of traveling to places like uh, Pennsylvania and North Dakota and Oklahoma, and little towns, Texas and Louisiana. And it's, it's remarkable what's changing. Um, there are little towns um, that saw people moving away for years. Young people had no future and now they're moving back. If anybody has had a chance, anyone in this room had a chance to go to Williston, North Dakota by any chance? Raise your hand. Have you been to Williston? It's um, a modern day gold rush. And um, I'll leave some time at the end. If people have been there, love to talk about it. It's a fascinating place. In the summer, it's dirty and hot. Um, in the winter, it's unbelievably cold. And yet, you have people coming from all over the country and all over the world to this little town, it was a little town, um, that's just booming. It's a modern day gold rush. And just to see it, um, the sociological um, aspect that was fascinating, how they're building this almost overnight, and the infrastructure, the, the town's trying to plan, um, plan for the future. And it's all because oil is surging out of this area called the Bakken Formation, which is North Dakota and some Montana as well. And again, you had people, you had farmers, uh, homeowners in North Dakota and Pennsylvania and other kinds of places with no real future. Excuse me. And, excuse me. And now, thanks to fracking and thanks to horizontal drilling, we'll talk about what that is, um, they can, can stay in their farms and their homes because they're making a lot of money from leasing their land for drilling. So there's the economic impact, there's the geopolitical impact, which I think only now people are starting to, to understand or at least think about, and I think it's going to have dramatic impact over the next few years. So as we continue to produce more and more oil and gas, I think the Middle East becomes less important to us. So it's not to say that it will be, won't be important as long as oil is in the Middle East, the Middle, um, um, as long as oil comes out of there and we have, and we have allies in the Middle East, um, the Middle East will always be important, but it'll be less important. And especially if Hillary wins in 2016, because when she was Secretary of State, she led this rethinking in terms of foreign policy and in this effort, this idea to pivot to Asia. And again, we're not going to give up on the Middle East. Obviously, there's all kinds of stuff, ISIS and, and other allies that mean we have to focus on it. But at the margin, I think it's going to be less important. I don't think it's a coincidence that Saudi Arabia begged us to bomb Syria about a year uh, and a half ago. And we kind of said, no, you know, we don't care as much what the Saudis think because we're producing all this oil in part. Um, we can boycott Iran um, because, partly because we're adding all this oil. And just over the last few weeks, we're seeing global energy prices collapse. And that's because the Saudis are scared 
about losing market share to the frackers, as well as some other uh, issues as well. But it's partly because we've moved, again, our production from 5 million barrels a day to 9 million barrels. And so that four, you know, it's, it's, it's dramatic for us. In the scheme of things, it's about 5% or so of global production. But at the margin, that's important. And the margins where you set prices. So geopolitics is going to be fascinating. And if we pull back a little bit, from the, at least at the margin from the Middle East, and what does that mean? Does that mean that China plays a bigger role? I've talked to, to ex-generals and, and people in Washington about that, and some people say that's a great thing. Why should we be, um, the burden be only on us? We've lost um, lives, and, and it costs us lots of money getting involved in entanglements in the Middle East. Why shouldn't other people chip in? And other people say, do we want China to, to be a player, a, a more assertive role in, in global geopolitics and in the Middle East? Maybe not. So these are things I think that people are going to start focusing on beyond the, the economic impact. There's also the environmental impact obviously, of this um, energy revolution. I'm going to leave some time at the end to talk about the uh, environmental impact, but it's, it's dramatic, and, and, and not in just in a negative way, in a positive way. We have cut our carbon dioxide emissions in this country um, to levels that we haven't seen in 12 years or so. So we got criticized. The rest of the world kind of laughed at us that we didn't sign Kyoto. We're compliant with Kyoto. And the other countries are addicted to coal, and not just any coal, our coal. So we are compliant with Kyoto, and carbon dioxide emissions, which are greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, our emissions are dropping because we're shifting from coal to natural gas. Not completely, but we're shifting. And the rest of the world hasn't figured out a way to tap their own shale, or they're not interested in doing it. Shale is a kind of rock we'll talk about in a second. So. England, I was in England and um, for my book, and uh, I was talking to people there and on the BBC, and you can make a really strong argument there why they should be fracking, because the North Sea's oil is dropping, and um, they're relying on, on Russia, and you don't want to be do that, you, you, want, you, you don't want that to happen, um, and they are buying our coal. It's um, crazy. Um, we're shipping coal to Newcastle, um, literally, and it's a crazy concept. So. Um, to me, I would argue that shifting from coal to natural gas likely, we'll talk about why it may not be the case, but likely is a, is a positive thing for the environment. But there are also a lot of dangers too, and we're gonna talk about that as well. So there are all kinds of, of um, dramatic impacts that this revolution has happened, is, is having, and I'm just sort of scratching the surface, and we can talk about some others. So as I started doing work on this book and, and traveling the country, a, um, a paradox jumped out at me. And the paradox, um, it's a theme that, believe it or not, was very similar to the financial crisis. And I did a book back in 2009, it's called The Greatest Trade Ever. And it's about the individuals who anticipated the financial meltdown and made money from it. So if you think about it, who should have anticipated the financial meltdown? Well, it should have been the Fed, right, Bernanke, and Greenspan and Geithner, and they all missed it. It should have been the heads of the banks. They all missed it. All the experts got it wrong. The top guys at Wall Street, they all got it wrong. And who got it right? It's a few kind of oddball, colorful characters that I wrote about in my first book. There's a guy named uh, John Paulson, who is a hedge fund manager. Um, but he, he didn't know anything about housing, really. He was a merger arm. In other words, he specialized in investing in companies that were merging together. He didn't know anything about mortgages and, and real estate and that kind of thing. And yet he uh, and his firm made $20 billion over two years uh, in 2007 and 2008, anticipated the financial crisis. So he wasn't the most likely person to anticipate the crisis. Um, there was another individual I wrote about in my book named Jeffrey Green. Jeffrey Green was a 50-year-old uh, real estate investor in Los Angeles, so he knew real estate, but another odd kind of guy. He got married late in life. Best man in his wedding was Mike Tyson, uh, the boxer. Um, he had a, a house guest for a while. Before that, uh, Heidi Fleiss, the um, Hollywood madam. Remember that? Remember her? And yet this guy made $500 million during the financial meltdown that none of the experts could predict. No one expected it. So that's sort of a theme that I found interesting about the financial crisis. And as I started traveling the country and talking to the people behind this energy revolution, remarkably to me, it was the same exact theme. So who should have led an energy revolution in this country. Well, it should have been, excuse me, 
Should have been the big oil companies, right? They're so powerful, the lobbyists in Washington, and they're so smart, deep pockets, Exxon Mobil. Exxon Mobil's headquarters, their literal headquarters are in Irving, Texas. In their backyard, literally behind their headquarters, is, if you gotta drill down a mile below the surface, is ground zero for this revolution. It's called the Barnett Shale. It's where they started finding a lot of natural gas, and I'll talk about how it happened. And it was literally underneath them, and yet were they drilling there? No, they were offshore, they were in Africa, they were in Asia, they were anywhere but their own backyard. They'd given up on America. So it should have been Exxon leading this revolution, and they didn't. Who else? Chevron. I write about them in, in my book, The Frackers. Chevron was early. They had a group led by pretty senior executives, sharp guy um, named Ray Galvin. People liked him, popular guy within the company. He brought in some really interesting talent, smart guys elsewhere in the company, engineers, geologists. And Galvin said, let's try this new kind of drilling. Um, they called it non-conventional drilling at the time. And that basically means let's target this rock called shale. And again, some people, forgive me, people that know what, what, what it is and, and are experts. Shale is a kind of rock that um, is, is throughout the country and throughout the world. And it's um, a very difficult rock. It's compressed. It's a little bit like tombstone. People call it tombstone rock in the industry. And everyone always knew. It was no secret. Everyone always knew it was packed with oil and gas. Um, it's sort of um, the kitchen. It's where it's creative. Then over millions of years, it, it flows up. All rock is in, in oh, I'm sorry, all uh, energy, all and gas is in rock, and it's buried down below. It's what's called fossil fuels. And then it was in the shale, which is, again, a mile below the surface, even more. And over millions of years, it, it flowed up naturally closer to the surface. And then we would um, traditionally drill down vertically, like with a straw kind of thing, and hit pockets of oil and gas, and that's how we would get our oil and gas. But if you go down for farther below, you get this shale, which is where it all was created. And everyone always kind of said, ah, I wish we could get there. Sort of like the dream of, of every geologist. If only we could somehow figure out a way to get the shale. And Ray Galvin said, guys, let's go figure it out. And he brought a lot of good talent in. They were making progress. And they could have been the ones to lead the country and the world. But slowly but surely, people at Chevron started undermining what they were doing. Um, poaching talent from this group he had assembled, making fun of them behind their back and to their face. And finally, they gave up on the effort and they disbanded the group. So Chevron should have led the, the effort, BP, all the big guys were caught flat-footed by this revolution and they had given up on America. They, had, they were drilling anywhere but America for all intents and purposes. There were some drilling, but the big guys didn't see any future here. So the experts, once again, just like the financial crisis, got it wrong. And it wasn't just, just the energy guys. Wall Street got it completely wrong. In 2007, there was the largest leveraged buyout, uh, an acquisition using debt, in history. Uh, and it was a company called TXU. TXU was a utility in, it still is, they changed the name, a utility in Texas. And the whole theme, the whole reason for this acquisition was, well, natural gas prices are going to have to go higher because we were running out of natural gas in this country. Everyone said it. All the experts were convinced. Conventional wisdom is we were running out of natural gas prices. So if supply of natural gas tumbles, then prices are going to have to go higher. And a higher TXU is going to be a gold mine for us. And who did the TXU deal? It was a who's who on Wall Street. It was TPG, KKR, Goldman Sachs. Warren Buffett bought up the debt of TXU. In other words, all the smartest investors agreed with all the experts in the energy industry that we as a nation were running out of natural gas and oil and prices were going to have to go higher and we were going to suffer as a nation. And they all got it wrong. So who got it right? That's who, what my book is about. My book is about the kind of colorful, unusual, surprising oddballs who led this revolution. So I'm going to talk a little bit about them uh, tonight. And I'll talk about some, some um, I'll give a thesis or two as to why they led the revolution and why others didn't. So the first is a guy named George Mitchell, who at least one person in this room knows, not related to the senator. Uh, George Mitchell's a really interesting guy. Um, I went out to see him a few years ago. Uh, he was about 92, but sharp as a tack. And uh, I was a little nervous going out to see him. I'm, I'm a Wall Street kind of writer. and. 
not uh, not a Houston guy, not an oil guy, and George Mitchell. So I went out to see him, and he started telling me his life story. His um, father was an immigrant from Greece, a little town in Greece, and didn't really have much of a future there. So as a young man, he got on a boat, came to America. His name was Savas Paraskofopoulos. And he uh, gets off the boat, and they say, and they, they send them to go work uh, building the rail system from Arkansas to Texas in this country. And uh, one day, his uh, paymaster came to him looking pretty unhappy, and he said, Savas, what's with this name? I can't spell it. And so Savas said, well, what's your name? And he said, my name is Mike Mitchell. And he said, all right, I'll be Mike Mitchell too. <laughs> so he took his name, and his son is George Mitchell. Um, and I love that story because my own uh, great-grandfather got off the boat, and they said, what's your name? And I uh, said, well, Rumshinsky. And they said, we can't spell that. Take the last guy. It was Zuckerman. So, um, you know, it could have been O'Brien or Smith or something easy, but it was Zuckerman. So, yeah, we, we could relate to each other a little bit. And he told me the story, and I thought it was kind of fascinating. So, basically, he ran a company called Mitchell Energy. It was a mid-sized energy company. He was doing pretty well in Texas. And by around 1982 or so, he could see the writing on the wall. And he could see that his company was running out of natural gas. They weren't, they didn't have that many. They were running out, their, their, their formation, their, their source of, of natural gas was depleting. And they were responsible for about 10% of the natural gas going to Chicago. So they had some contracts out there and he didn't want to see his fortune dissipate. So he had to figure something out. So he said, he was an optimistic guy, creative guy. He said, guys, we don't have this acreage that Exxon and all these guys do um, offshore in Asia and Africa. We've got Texas. Let's figure it out. Instead of, yeah, we're running out of natural gas up here, a little higher up and below the surface. Let's drill down and try to get this shale and try to figure out how to get release natural gas from shale. And so they started working on it. And again, 1982 or so. And what they did was frack it. And that means hydraulically fracture it. It's become sort of a uh, controversial uh, word and in, in, um, in endeavor. It basically, it just means pummeling rock, this rock, the shale rock usually, with a combination of liquids, and usually mostly water with some chemicals and some sand. And the whole idea is you pummel it and you try to create little fractures, little fissures in the rock that allow natural gas to be released and later oil. Excuse me. So um, they started working on it around 1982. And by 1997 or so, this group, there was a small group working on it. They weren't making much progr progress at all. And they were getting pretty frustrated. The oil industry was, was really having problems back then. There was a guy named Nick Steinsberger who was helping to lead the effort. And he told his wife that if it doesn't work pretty soon, we're going to have to forget about leave the company. We're going to have to find another industry. There's no way I'm going to find another job after this. And by then, um, Mitchell uh, had, um, his wife had early signs of uh, Alzheimer's. His, uh, he had uh, cancer. He was uh, semi-retired from the, the company. And there was his heir apparent, a guy named Bill Stevens, I don't know if you know Bill Stevens, he did not believe in what they were doing at all. He didn't believe in drilling for shale. He, um, behind Mitchell's back and even in front of him, he said, why are we wasting our time on this shale thing? It's not going to work. Everyone knows, yeah, there's a lot of oil and gas buried in shale, but it's going to be too expensive to get it out, George. And, he, and George said, we can do it. We can do it. But he was sort of not running things day to day. And it was really up to these guys, Nick Steinsberger and his team. And they were nervous because the heir apparent, the guy who was going to run the commons, was really running his day to day. Bill Stevens didn't believe what they were doing. Uh, they um, weren't making much progress. And then one day, what happened was um, they used a company to do the, the hydraulic fracturing. And again, you're pummeling it with this liquid concoction. And one day they used way too much, by mistake, way too much water. So it was mostly water with a little bit of chemicals, a little sand as you, as you pummel this rock. And lo and behold, this well produced a pretty good amount of natural gas. Not dramatic, nothing amazing, but Nick Steinsberg said, well, hold on a second. Yeah, we made a mistake here, and there was much too much water, but look how much natural gas is coming out of here. Maybe we should keep working on this uh, water-heavy substance, liquid. And all the experts, Schlumber Schlumberger and all the, all the guys, the, the experts in the field said, no, you're a fool. You can't use so much water on shale. It's sort of a clay-like substance when you pummel it, and it's going to create a whole muck. But Steinsberg didn't have much choice left, right? He, he was running out of time, and it was a lot cheaper to use water. So he's like, let's just try it. And this story, my story, is really a story of 
American persistence and trial and error and technological innovation. It's really a technology story in a lot of ways. And they kept working at it. And slowly but surely, they improved their methods, but it was mostly with water still. They tweaked it and they showed you can get a lot of natural gas from this shale rock in our country. And lo and behold, they, they started producing natural gas. And a few years later, in 2002, Mitchell sold his company, became a billionaire. And they showed the world you can get a lot of natural gas from shale. But even then, people in the industry said, all right, George, good job. In, in Barnett area in Texas, you found you can get natural gas from shale. Who's to say you can do it elsewhere in the country? And that's where sort of the baton was passed to some other people, like um, Aubrey McClendon and Tom Ward. So Aubrey McClendon and Tom Ward, I'll tell you a little bit about them. Aubrey McClendon um, was born on the right side of the tracks in a little town in, in Oklahoma City. Um, he comes from the Kerr-McGee family, not the, not the best part of the Kerr-McGee family where they were very wealthy, but upper middle class. He went to Duke. He um, majored in history. Again, not the most likely guy to change the country, uh, Duke uh, grad. He majored in history, nothing to do with no engineering or geology or anything like that. And uh, he graduated and he was going to be an accountant. but. Yeah, he, went, he said, hey, I'll go back home to Oklahoma. He had an opportunity there, and he became a landman. And a landman is somebody who goes out and, and, and creates deals, works out deals with, with uh, homeowners and with farmers and kind of goes door to door and says, hey, uh, we'd love to lease your acreage. And, he, and they work for people, and they work out deals. And you have to be outgoing, and Arby Clendon is really outgoing and a great salesman, and he really is personable. And he became, you're not going to make a fortune as a landman, but that's what he started doing. And he kept bumping into this other guy, Tom Ward, uh, in his, in his, as he was going around the area leasing up land. And Tom Ward came from the other side of the tracks in Oklahoma, a little town I visited um, called Sealing. His um, grandfather was a, um, was a notorious um, 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 drunk. He, he, he'd get drunk and kind of stumble to church each week, and his father too. Um, and women were warned not to, not to marry into the Ward family. Uh, it was a troubled family. And Tom Ward um, found religion, literally, uh, at a young age, and it kind of settled him and fell in love early. That helped him too. And he set out to be a landman, not as outgoing and, pers as, and as personable, personable as Aubrey McClendon, but, very, uh, but, but a good salesman in his own way. And they started um, bumping into each other, or landmen, um, leasing up land. And they said, you know what? The real money is in finding oil and gas. Let's start a company to do that. And they did. It's a company called Chesapeake Energy. And they weren't the first ones to realize that you can get a lot of oil and gas from shale, like George Mitchell. And what they did more than other people is they, they got it and they said they ran with it. They said, we're going to lease up as much land in this country as we can. And they kept leasing and leasing all over this country. And at one point, they had um, Chesapeake Energy had enough energy, uh, I'm sorry, they had the acreage equivalent to several times the state of New Jersey. So they were just leasing everywhere, all over the place, and they were finding a lot of oil and gas. And by 2008, McClendon and Ward were worth several billion dollars each. About McClendon was worth about three billion dollars. They were trading on the side. They were borrowing share, borrowing money to buy their own stock. To do, and they were trading stuff elsewhere and um, doing aggressive stuff and intentionally inappropriate stuff. Um, and but he was riding high and he was the hero. And the whole country was starting to say, you know what? Maybe he's got it right. Maybe we can find a lot of natural gas. And he's leading us. Um, and he became the, kind of the spokesman. And then I write about in the book how in one awful week in 2008, uh, natural gas prices started coming down, uh, had been coming down, and, the, and his stock had been coming down. And he had borrowed so much money, over $500 million from banks, um, to buy his own shares. And they gave him a margin call, like a, a bookie call on a gambler and said, you've got to pay up because his collateral had shrunk in size. He was borrowing money based on his own shares. And he basically, and he, he couldn't come up with the money. And I talk about how in a, in a few weeks, he went from a guy worth about $3 billion to, it's not clear whether it was, he was net, net positive at all. Um, no one, I don't think this country has ever lost so much so quickly uh, in such a quick amount of time. So he kind of led this charge and it cost him, but he slowly kind of came back. Um, the company kept expanding. They eventually kicked him out. <laughs> 
But um, as is the case with a lot of these personalities, this really um, super confident, optimistic um, in individuals, they kicked him out, but he's starting up again. And now he's leading a new charge into uh, Ohio and some other places in Texas. And once again, finding a lot of natural gas. Um, and, and he's kind of, we, we have to, him to thank for, in, in a lot of ways, for lower natural gas prices. So he's, his fortune goes up and down and like a roller coaster and he can be quite aggressive and his old shareholders weren't happy about it, but he's really, in a lot of ways, changed the country. Um, there's another individual who has as well named Harold Hamm. Harold Hamm is a real rags to riches story. A lot of characters in my book are either immigrants, it's a very American book, a lot of immigrants, a lot of older people who struggled and tried to hit their home run for their whole lives and finally in their 60s, 70s, finally did it. So Harold Hamm's a, a fascinating uh, individual. He grew up um, really dirt poor in a little town in Oklahoma as well. Uh, he was the 13th of 13 children. He um, was so poor that uh, his parents were sharecroppers and he couldn't go to school each year till around Christmas time because he had to help his parents in the fields. They were uh, picking watermelon and cotton and only by Christmas time was it so cold that he, they didn't need his help anymore. They, there was no more picking to be done, so he could start going to school around Christmas time. Um, he didn't go to college, didn't learn any engineering or geology. Again, that theme of unusual people leading this charge. But he had this hunger to be an oil man, to become an oil man, and he, partly because he grew up so poor. And he kind of saw the only wealthy people in that part of the, of, of the state, in that part of the country, were, were the oil guys who had been successful. And he wanted to be like them. He didn't want to um, have to struggle so much. He remembers the, his little shack of a home burned down one day, and it became a happy day for him. He remembers that in a, in a positive way away because neighbors chipped in and bought him a new pair of shoes and that was the first new pair of shoes he ever had so he's a guy who didn't go to school he had this hunger and he and you can't just start finding oil and gas so what he did was start he started this little company to clean out the the muck in in the tankers he would, he would climb in there with like a long rake and scoop out the sediment. Um, he started a company doing that. Then he did transportation of water, water transport. And then he saved some money and he talked to a lot of old timers and he started wildcatting, betting on areas in Oklahoma. And he did pretty well. He had a good sense for things. He self-taught. He got books and, and really took some courses and, and, and he taught himself how to, how to be an, a geologist and um, or at least got a sense of it. And then he started hearing about up north, what was going on, or the possibilities in Montana, and then in North Dakota. This is an area called the Bakken, I think I mentioned earlier, it's called the Bakken Formation, and it was packed with oil. And forget about natural gas, that's what Aubrey McClendon and Tom Ward were racing after. Harold Hedham said, I'm gonna be the one to go find a lot of oil in this country. So he, he and his company, his company's called Continental Resources, they raced up there, and around 2000 or so, they started leasing up acreage up in North Dakota. They weren't the first ones, but they were among the first, and they leased up more than anybody else. And what they did was, and again, they weren't the first people, but they embraced it pretty early. They combined fracking, which again, this is pummeling the rock and releasing this natural gas and, and oil with horizontal drilling. So remember I said earlier that traditionally we drill down like vertically with a straw um, going into the grounds. Um, the problem with that is there are a lot of layers, shale in particular, the shale rock I talked about, which are really long and narrow. And the only way to tap it is to drill down vertically and then churn the drill bit 90 degrees and then go horizontally. And that's an American innovation. No one else was doing it. We've led the whole world both in fracking and in horizontal drilling. It's one of the reasons I really think that it's going to take years for the rest of the world to catch up to us for other reasons too. We can talk about that. Um, so Harold Hamm said, we're going to do horizontal drilling, we're going to do fracking, we're going to lead everybody, we're going to lease up the acreage. And they did, and they started doing it around 2000, and by 2006 or so, they also were ready to give up um, because they wasn't making much progress, they wouldn't get much oil. And they tried to sell their acreage, or at least half of it, and nobody wanted it. The big guys didn't want it, the medium-sized, small guys, nobody wanted it. So Hamm had no choice. He said, all right, let's keep all this acreage, but let's just go a little bit slower. Let's be persistent. Let's try to make it happen, try to find a lot of oil by tweaking it and figuring out new methods. Again, it's all trial and error and innovation, technological, technological innovation. Um, 
And they, and they went public in 2007, that helps. But even the guy, even the individual named Brian Hoffman, who had said to, to Harold Ham, hey boss, you know, yeah, we're in Montana, but North Dakota is where really the oil should be. Let's go over to North Dakota. So he's the one that told Continental Resources to go into North Dakota. When they went public, he sold all his shares. So he didn't really believe necessarily in what they were doing either, but they went public in 2007 and they kept working on it. And they started finding a lot of oil, as did their rivals in that area. And today, this Bakken region in North Dakota, a little bit Montana and Canada, produces about over a million barrels a day of the nine million in our uh, that we're producing as a nation. And this poor um, young man um, grew up, who grew up um, with so little, today he's worth $17 billion. Um, he is among the richest uh, Americans in the world. He's going through uh, an ugly divorce right now, unfortunately. Um, but his wife, this last week, uh, it was determined that uh, she's going to walk away with a billion dollars. Um, so she's going to be among the richest women right away in this country. And she's going to appeal, and she probably has a good chance of getting even more. So it's a real um, American rags to riches kind of story. There's one last individual I'll talk about, and his name is Sharif Suki. And Sharif is an immigrant from Lebanon, again, that immigrant uh, theme, um, American theme. He uh, was an investment banker on uh, Wall Street, made some money, retired early, went to go ski in Aspen for a while, um, started, he was a little bored, and started some restaurants and some, some bars. Anyone here remember by any chance the Mezzaluna restaurant in Los Angeles, why that's famous? Raise your hand if you remember that. Oh, pretty good. So that's where O.J. Simpson, uh, his wife, and Ron Goldman were the night that they were shot. They were killed. Shot. Uh, they were killed, and um, it became really part of the, of the infamous uh, case, uh, the Mezzaluna restaurant. Where they were that evening. He le uh, she left her glasses there that night, and then he went to get them. Ron Goldman brought them to Nicole Simpson Brown's uh, home, and then O.J. Simpson allegedly um, uh, killed him, um, and. Um, and it became obviously infamous, and so he owned this restaurant, and all of a sudden tourists started flocking from all over the country to come to this restaurant. They were stealing plates and, and silverware, anything with like Mezzaluna on it, and um, it really disgusted uh, Sharif Suki, and he said, you know what, I gotta find something else to do, and, and they weren't making that much money too, and by then he had gone through a divorce, and uh, it was, he was running out of money, so he said, all right, let me try this energy business. So he didn't know anything about energy, but he was very smart. He said, well, it, this was the late 1990s, and back then, if you remember, it was all about dot-com, dot-com this, pets.com, everything's dot-com, and no one wanted to have anything to do with the energy industry. So he said, all right, that must be mean that it's underinvested area, and there aren't enough people putting money into it, I'm going to focus on it. And he started focusing on it. He started a company called Chenier Energy. And they did some drilling, they used technology, advanced technology, didn't really go too far, but they came up with this idea. They said, well, hold on a second. If everybody, all of the experts say that we're running out of natural gas in this country, let's build a terminal uh, in Louisiana, on the coast, to import natural gas into this country. And it's called liquefied natural gas. Unlike oil, which you could just put in a tanker, natural gas is much harder. But if you liquefy it and you freeze it really cold, you can, you can ship it. Uh, it's a very expensive process, and these terminals are very expensive, but he's a very persuasive uh, individual, very sharp, Sharif. So he went around and, and they borrowed billions of dollars. And they, built this, they built this huge terminal I visited in Louisiana to import natural gas. And the stock was soaring and he was a wealthy guy. He was on top of the world. And then around 2007 or so, it started dawning on investors that uh, we're not running out of natural gas in this country. We actually have a surplus. We're developing a surplus of it. And natural gas prices were cut, came down, and Sharif Suki's company, Chenier, started tumbling because they were betting on our country running out of natural gas. Who needs to import liquefied natural gas if you've got it coming out of our ears, you know, in Pennsylvania and all? So um, he was stuck, and his stock went down to like a dollar share. His friends were calling, and they were worried about him. And his investors were kind of getting angry. They said, Sharif, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? We invested all this money, and you've built these terminals. What are you going to do? And Sharif didn't have an idea. He's like, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. And they didn't want to hear that. You know, they wanted an idea. What do you mean you'll figure it out? We, you've got our money, Sharif. And they were getting angry, and he was trying to buy time. He needed to figure out an idea. And then he realized, he made some big mistakes going into this, but he was the first one to really come to this realization. He said, wait, hold on a second. 
If we're developing this surplus, this excess of natural gas, instead of importing liquefied natural gas, maybe we should export it. And it was before anyone had really thought about that. And he went to the government, and no one had really asked. And he was the first one to get a permit uh, of this new group, the new era, to export uh, liquefied natural gas. It's not clear a few years later whether he would have gotten it. Um, he was a small company and such, but at the time, uh, they said, all right, you want to think about uh, exporting natural gas, here's a, here's a permit, permission. And then he still had to convince investors um, to, to, to borrow even more billions to refit these terminals. You can't just switch so easily. You have to actually invest billions and billions. So if you think about it, he had to go back to these investors and to others and say, you know that whole thing I talked to you about, about how we were running out of natural gas in this country? and we need to import it. Actually, it's, I couldn't have been more wrong. We're going to export natural gas. And in some ways, he was lucky because his investors had already written off their investment. They, they gave up on him. So they said, Sharif, if you could just give me back the money I gave with you, I'm fine. Good luck to you. And he convinced other people to invest. And they refit those, they borrowed billions, and they refit those terminals. And his company, Chenier Energy, is going to be the first one, starting, I believe, next year, to export natural gas from this country. Now, there are many companies that are going to follow, but he's the first one, and his stock has soared, and he's worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars now. So, again, it's a story of, of immigrants and persistence and um, new technology um, and colorful unexpected characters uh, leading this remarkable shift. So those are some of the key characters in my book, The Frackers. A couple of thoughts. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll assume somebody wants to talk about the environmental aspects and we'll, we'll leave that for the Q&A, but I just want to talk about, I want to answer really quickly and I'd love to hear if other people have thoughts. Why was it these guys? Why was it these unusual characters who led the revolution? No, I wasn't the Exxon Mobiles. Well, part of it is um, they didn't have a choice. So again, Exxon had acreage elsewhere, and guys like George Mitchell didn't, so you have to make it work um, when your back's against the wall. Um, um, <clears throat> and if you think about it, it's also the case that smaller companies innovate so much better, so much easier than the big um, behemoths. And it's true in other industries too, if you think about it. Microsoft had a group to do, to do search and combine it with advertising. And they closed it down after about a month. And you know, Google was able to, uh, to evolve and, 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 and take that market. Um, E-cigarettes started not at the big tobacco companies, but upstarts. Um, Coke and Pepsi um, have been left by the wayside um, by various kind of new kinds of drinks coming up in recent years. A lot of the pharmaceutical companies don't do a good job of innovating. They have to buy their way to it. So it's not unusual or unexpected to see smaller guys um, innovate much better and, and turn on a dime. There's a company I write about in my, in my book called EO. They were among the leaders in natural gas from shale, and then they realized they had a, 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 a almost a, the CEO almost had a panic attack. He said, "Well, hold on a second. We're doing we're finding all this natural gas. Won't that lead to a collapse in prices? Because everyone's finding natural gas." And they, to their credit, turned on a dime and started leasing up acreage in the Eagle Fur, which is a formation in Texas, and it was right underneath the noses of all the big giants. And they got so much acreage today. EOG is worth about. 50 or so billion dollars as a company. It's worth more than Southwest Airlines, um, Hershey, um, and Alcoa combined. And it's all because they turned on a dime and they were able to lease up this acreage um, quickly. So, um, so part of it is, is that theme that the smaller guys have a better shot. And there's good fortune as well. A lot of these people um, were sitting on some acreage. Um, there's a guy, um, named Terry Pagula, who was in Pennsylvania. He was doing all right, nothing special. And he was producing natural gas from, from areas. And lo and behold, other people elsewhere figured out how to get shale to release a lot of natural gas. So he said, ah, I'm gonna do the same thing. And he went down below. Today he's worth billions. He's, he just bought the Buffalo Sabres and the Buffalo Bills a football team. So there's good fortune that's necessary as well. So those are some thoughts from uh, the frackers and from this era, uh, this renaissance of, of uh, energy production in this country. Um, I'll leave it there, and we can talk about um, the environmental aspects and anything else that um, we want to talk about, you guys want to talk about. An environmental question to start with. Sure. These guys are making all this money, doing these tasks, and they're going to lose their jobs. Yeah. Why are they doing that? Well, the
Okay, so I will, let me address the environment. Your, your question sort of presupposes the risk, and I'm not saying there isn't, I'll talk about it. I think you're suggesting that there's risk that the chemicals get into the water. Let me take a step back and talk about um, what, the, what people are worried about when it comes to the environmental aspects of fracking. And I'm gonna talk about the three biggest concerns people have. I'm gonna talk about why I'm not concerned about those three at all, or not that much at all. And I'm gonna talk about what I am concerned about. Um, when it comes to environmental aspects. So the three biggest things that people worry about are um, methane getting into the water. People I'm sure have seen the HBO movie, um, Gasland, where they open up, turn on the faucet, and they light a match, and there's a fireball, and it's very disturbing. Have you got, and raise your hand if you've seen that. Um, sure, that's sort of a lot of people's views of fracking were formed by that movie, and that scene even. Um, it's a very disturbing scene, again, where you turn on the faucet and light a match and, and it blows it up. Um, so methane getting into the water is the, big, is the is first concern. Chemicals getting into the water because a lot of these chemicals are not the kind you want to ingest. Again, it's mostly water with some sand and chemicals, but they do a lot of fracking all over the country, so you don't want to ingest any of this, these chemicals if you can avoid it. And then the third thing that people worry about are earthquakes. Uh, that you're starting to see in some parts of the country. So I'm going to tell you why those three things I'm not worried about at all, then I'll talk about what I am worried about. Um, first of all, methane. So it is true that um, in some parts of the country, you could turn on the faucet and light a match and cause a, a fireball. The problem is, it's always been the case for parts of our country. So um, the Native Americans used to do as a trick, used to light water on fire. Uh, Americans did uh, for many years, for, for a long time. There are three towns in this country called Burning Springs. There's Burning Springs, New York, Burning Springs, Kentucky, and Burning Springs, um, West Virginia. And that's because naturally in some parts of the country, the methane, excuse me, um, sorry, the rock, the rock is so close to the surface that naturally the methane gets into the water. And, um, you know, I travel to Dimmick. Dimmick is sort of uh, ground Zero for the protests. It's a little town in Pennsylvania where um, so oil and gas companies made horrible mistakes and and you know, led to, to led to problems with people's water. And um, there are all kinds of protests. And and I talked to people there. I talked to some old timers. And one one woman said, "Greg, we used to go to school when I was little. Get there early, turn on the faucet, light a match, and run for it." So methane just naturally gets into the water. Um, in many parts of this country. So that's not really a concern of mine. The other is chemicals. And um, chemicals isn't much of a concern when you talk to scientists, as I did for my book, because we're drilling so far below the surface. So we drill all the way down a mile below, 4,000 feet, let's say, below. And the water is about 400 feet below, let's say, in, in the Barnett. You know, it varies around the country. So when you talk to scientists, they say, yeah, it's possible that Again, they drill down, they go horizontally, and then they start fracking. So it's possible that these chemicals can somehow rise from 4,000 feet to 400 feet, but it's really, really unlikely. It's much more likely that you know you and I, unfortunately, will whatever step into something on the way home. So um, it's possible that you know that life is full of risks, but it's a very low, low probability. Um, the third are the earthquakes, and they're really more tremors. They're not like. Um, serious earthquakes and that's not really from fracking really it's really from you get a lot of liquid that comes up waste and such um, in the fracking process and they have to do something with it so what they've done is they've re-injected it below the surface below even where the shale is they figure you know stick it all the way down there it should be fine and what they're finding is that's actually disturbing the geology and they're gonna have to figure something out with that so um, they will. More water is going to be um, recycled, and that's a good thing. And they'll figure it out. They'll have to map out where they can re-inject and where they can't. So I'm not worried about those three things. So what, what am I worried about? Um, in the process of fracking, methane is released. And, and um, actually, yeah, we'll talk about that. Um, in the process of fracking, methane is released. And methane is a greenhouse gas, and it's a very dangerous greenhouse gas. And we're not sure how much methane is released, both in the, in the, in the fracking process, in the drilling, but also in the transportation of, 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 of natural gas around the country. And it could be the case that so much methane is released as we produce all this natural gas that it makes it worse than coal. Now, the latest studies show that it's not so much released, and it's gotten better. Um, we're not releasing as much as we used to, but it's still troublesome. We shouldn't be releasing any of it. We should, be, we should have more laws. I'm not sure why the government doesn't crack down. It's a state-by-state -state thing. The government should be encouraging um, states to crack down on methane release. Um, and again, it makes you 
less sure that this is a net net positive for the environment. I'm still pretty confident, but not nearly as confident as I should be. So um, I worry about methane leakage, and I worry that we're becoming addicted to uh, fossil fuels. So long term, we all know that we've got to shift to sustainables, to solar and, and wind and such. And um, I worry that cheap oil and gas has enabled us to, or, or is going to encourage us to, to sh um, move our sites away from sustainable energy. Now, I think, I'm a more optimistic guy about these kind of things, so I think it'll work out well in the end, because I think we're, when you talk to guys on Wall Street, people just want to make money. I'm a big capitalist. I work in the Wall Street Journal. Um, I think good things happen when there's, a, there, there's incentive there, and uh, when we don't do the kind of cylindrical kind of things. So um, I do believe that there are people who want to get rich by helping us shift to solar and to wind. The problem is we just don't have the, um, the, the, we, we, the, the wind doesn't always blow and the, the sun isn't always out. So we need um, a battery kind of, can, kind of thing to hold it. Um, and until we develop that and people are working on it, we really can't shift. So my hope is that this era buys us time and allows us to do more research and in a few years, 5, 10, 20, we can really make a shift towards sustainable energy. I'm, I'm hoping I'm not naive, we'll see. Hold on one second. The, the third uh, concern, my last area, I mean, I'm doing this um, briefly, is that um, fracking can be done safely, but it always, isn't always done safely. So about one in 10 times, the, um, the structure, when you drill down, you have a casing around the well, it's steel and cement, um, it runs into problems and there's leakage. So that's, tr that's problematic, that's really troublesome. That's, that's where you could get chemicals leaked and, and such. Um, so that's just a matter of forcing the frackers, instead of condemning them and wishing they would go away and wishing that we'd all you know, not have now lights and, and air conditioning and heating and all that kind of stuff, let's put pressure on them, that's my argument, to do a better job. And they are doing a better job, but they should be doing more of it and um, make sure the structure is sound and the casing and, and such. So, uh, does that answer your question? Hopefully. Okay, sorry. Do you know in any American universities which train oil engineers have added the fact that the training program in practice? That's a really good question. I don't know. I do know that those that have them are really popular, and these guys make, I saw the average salary of people. Um, with these kind of degrees, you probably know as well as I do, they're just um, on par with Wall Street and maybe even higher in some places. So they're making a fortune right now. It's a cyclical industry. Let's see how long it lasts and oil gas uh, prices have, have tumbled. But um, there are, I don't know if there are more courses, those that are already being offered are really popular and they're making a lot of money, the graduates. The, what is, I'm sorry? Yeah, so, and I apologize, you asked me to repeat the question, so I'll, sure. Um, so the question is, um, at what price, oil and gas prices are tumbling now, so at what price does this revolution end? Does it, does it threaten the revolution? That's a good question. So oil prices have been falling lately, largely because the Saudis are worried about market share. And you could argue maybe they're they, they don't like a lot of our enemies too, Iran and, and Russia, and they're trying to... Um, 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 weaken them. There are all kinds of reasons. But part of the problem is they're, they're also worried about market share. They're losing market share. They're worried about losing market share to the frackers. And as a result, um, and as a result that also because our production, I mean, we were producing, as I said, 9 million barrels a, d a day. Even a year ago, I think it was like 8.2 maybe. It's really soaring just over the last couple of years, last few years. In any case, when you talk to people in the industry, people talk about $70 a barrel as being starting to be really worrisome. And now we're at like 76 or so, so we're starting to get close to it. Depends where. The Bakken is a little more expensive than some places in Texas. So there I would argue it's 70. 
if you can generalize, and 65 is probably in some places in Texas, like the Eagle Ford and the Permian Basin. So we're starting to get close to that level where it threatens the revolution. But I would just argue, okay, so let's say these guys pull back and they don't drill as much and they don't produce as much. Well, that'll probably raise prices again, and then they'll start producing again. And the great thing for all of us as citizens is it kind of keeps a lid on oil and gas prices uh, for the foreseeable future. And, you know, who doesn't like to pay less at the pump? Yeah, natural gas is a more domestic market. So uh, when our economy does a little better, that does better, and the weather as well. Um, as I said, it's hard to transport natural gas, so that's what makes it more domestic, whereas the international market determines um, oil. And these are both difficult. I mean, if China, you tell me what China's growth is going to be, I can probably get a better guess for uh, what oil is, but who knows? It's hard to tell. Good question. Um, some parts, yeah. I mean, listen, um, North Dakota has 2%, 2.5% unemployment. The mayor in Wilson says, if you don't have a job, you don't want a job. And you see people starting to move to some of those places. I'm not sure it's going to rival the wealth of, you know, Upper, Upper East Side or anything. Um, but yeah, no, they're going to have um, a lot of money to invest. The state is going to have money. They don't tax so much, so that hurts them. They don't tax all as much in Pennsylvania. Um, but it's, it is helping some of those places. Uh, Texas has done really well over the last couple of years, last few years, relative to the country. If you see job creation, I mean, there's no fracking in California. And if you see, I, I, I have great data to show Texas um, job creation versus California. It's remarkable how, much, how many more jobs you're seeing in Texas. So Texas has been quite strong. Um, so at the margin, you could see um, wealth shifting to some of those places. Yeah, I've seen my economists write about that. Sure. They, um, they're regulated state by state, as well as you've got the EPA as well. But traditionally, states have played a bigger role in regulating drilling. And me, as a reporter, I'm always skeptical. As, oh, I'm always worried that you know, this local state guy is on the take or something, or is in bed or in the same country club as, as the oil and gas guy. Um, but their argument is always that the states know the geology. And the geology is fascinating. It changes dramatically, just um, state to state. So um, they know the geology better, so they're the ones who should be regulating it. And just to, to address regulation, quietly, there's been some really impressive stuff done over the last year or so. Uh, Wyoming, when it comes to water, um, Pennsylvania has a nice compromise. So the, the, the anti-fracking, um, the fractivists get a lot of headlines, but quietly, there's been some compromise going on. And, uh, EDF, Environmental Defense Fund, they get a lot of criticism from the left, but they've worked with some energy producers in Pennsylvania to work out a compromise, and there should be much more of it. I'm not sure in terms of methane leakage. This is such low-hanging stuff, and um, I do think the federal government maybe should play a bigger role, and especially just encouraging the states to, to crack down more. And the, the, the medium-sized medium and, and larger um, oil and gas companies almost often want more regulation because sometimes the smaller guys are the ones who do bad stuff and make mistakes. Um, Cabot Energy, Cabot Oil and Gas was uh, in the in the Dimmick area and they made a remarkable number of mistakes early on. They've learned their lessons, they would argue, and people around that area are much bigger fans. But early on, they were just, they weren't used to it. You know, um, one thing I've learned from, from traveling the country and talking to these oil and gas guys is I, I, I imagine they would be sort of these cigar chomping, uh, you know, double-breasted suits, you know, giggling their way to, with, their, with their bags of money, ha, 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 you know, spilling left and right. And then you, you talk to them, and they all have ranches. They, they're all fishermen, or, or, or they're, they like guns. They're outdoorsmen. I'm in my desk all day long, you know. They like the environment as much as you and I do. So they're not evil people. They make mistakes all the time. Um, and we should be putting more pressure on them, and the state should be too.